Good morning. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, good morning. Please take your seats and settle down. I'd like to invite everyone who's still out there also to please come in. Take your seats, please. Brethren, Apostle John recorded in this gospel that just before his betray betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion, the Lord Jesus said these words to his disciples. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, before that, this is in chapter 16 of the Gospel of John, Jesus speaks to the disciples of his impending death and departure as well as their desertion. So, he tells them, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I'm not alone for my Father is with me. Now, certainly, this must have been disconcerting for the disciples to hear. Which is why Jesus immediately followed up with his comforting words. I have told you this thing so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So, see, we see realities that, that uh, two realities that Jesus was telling the disciples. That the followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus will suffer great distress. And, but then Jesus, secondly, has already won the victory. So he did not want you know, the, the disciples to be under the delusion that their life in the future and in the, in their future ministry also would be full of ease and comfort, prosperity and health and all. No, he doesn't want them to think like that. And certainly, the Lord doesn't want us to think that either. That when we follow him, everything will be just smooth sailing, everything will be just nice and easy and comfortable. No. Following the Christ could be difficult and there will be opposition and trouble. Yet, still, the reality of Jesus' victory over sin and death through His own death and resurrection provides peace and courage for us in the midst of all oppositions and troubles. The certainty of trouble applies not only, of course, to those disciples, but also to all who follow Him. Even Apostle Paul stated bluntly, in 2 Timothy 3.12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So anyone who claims that believing in Jesus brings financial prosperity, physical health, and perfect relationships hasn't read his Bible. Love, life is tough, and the Christian life is often tougher. And the Bible, far from dodging this fact, acknowledges it and embraces it. Jesus himself, our Lord himself, guaranteed it. And instead of promising to eliminate trouble from our lives, our gracious Lord instead promises to give peace and comfort in the midst of trouble. So an appropriate way to respond to Jesus' words here is to ask ourselves, what do I hope in? Right? What do I hope in? Jesus' claim of victory over the world is in reference to His death, burial, and resurrection when He says, I have overcome the world. So the finished work of Christ removes the feet from suffering. By entering into our world and suffering alongside of us, Jesus offers certain hope, living hope, that transcends the temporal sorrow and sufferings this world throws at His followers. And therefore, we are not called to overcome the world ourselves because Jesus already did. He provides His children with a certain future, a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That's in 2 Peter 3, 1, 3 to 4. So it is because of this reality, Jesus tells us, we can take heart and be of good courage. So ask that indeed, what do I hope in? Could it be that troubles and trials make our hearts sick because we are placing our hope in that which does not satisfy our souls? A job? A relationship, a position? Well, the Lord calls us not to place our hope in temporal uncertain things, but in His eternal victory over sin and death on the cross of Calvary. If your treasure and your hope is not in Christ, then this encouragement of the Lord to take heart will mean little to you. But if you are a follower of Jesus and your hope is in Christ, then rest assured 
that no trouble or trial in this life will take that living hope away from you. Praise be to our God. So let us understand even this morning and remember that true and lasting courage must be based in an assurance, not in ourselves, but in Christ, in what He has accomplished on the cross. Whenever Jesus uttered the phrase, take heart or be of good courage, He always back it up with an assurance regarding His own work. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are called to take heart. Not in our own abilities or willpower, but in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Let our hope be in Christ alone, the crucified Savior, the living Lord, the risen Lord, the King of our, of our lives. So brethren, please rise. Let us now sing. Let us sing and express our hope is indeed not in this life, not in this passing world's reward, but our hope is in a life that, is, that will never fade, a life that is in Christ Jesus. Yes, sing and say, Oh my soul, put your hope in God, for God alone is our rock, our refuge. He is indeed the God of our salvation. Let's praise the Lord with His songs. Not in this life, not this passing world's reward, but my hope is in the life that will never fade. My hope is in you, Jesus, risen King, ascended Lord, even death itself cannot hold you in the grave. Raging and I'm battered by the waves. You're my refuge and my strength. I shall not be moved. When the night surrounds me and I cannot see my way, you will find me in your righteousness and your truth. When this early veil is finally stripped away When we hear that trumpet And you come with awesome power We shall gaze upon the radiance of your face Jesus, you've gone before us
give a clap offering to the Lord. You are indeed our hope, Lord. Hope is hidden 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing to worry or fear in this life. For we can never be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, we give you glory. We give you glory. You are indeed the Lord of our salvation. Your grace is strong. You are strong to save. And you are faithful in love, Lord. We put our hope in Christ alone. He has paid the penalty of our sin. The victory is won. We have been free also, Lord, from the power of sin. And one day, we will be completely liberated from the presence of sin when we finally see you face to face, when we finally be with you in your glory. So we sing this song now together, O God, pouring our grateful hearts unto you, blessing your name. You are the Lord of our salvation. Lord is my salvation. 
And when I reach my final day, He will not leave me in the grave. Heavenly Father, thank you for offering peace and courage in the midst of troubles of life. The troubles that we are facing did not catch you by surprise. Neither are they outside of your control, O oh Lord. So help us to take heart in the midst of our troubles by remembering the finished work of our Lord Jesus. Oh Jesus, you have defeated the ultimate enemy. And even though our trials might be painful, we know that they will not be able to separate us from your great love. In fact, you promise to strengthen us through them. God, thank you for your rich mercy that you send your son, Jesus, to enter into human suffering and conquer death forever. You are good, O oh Lord. You are faithful. And we praise you for giving us this incorruptible, unfading inheritance in Christ. So help us to place our hope not in the things of this world, but only in you, O Christ, only in Christ alone. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. We'd like to ask the children now to uh, prepare to go to their classes. So we'd like to pray for you, kids, before you head off. Can you please stand, children? All right. All right. We'll pray for you first. Okay. 
Let's pray. Dear God and Father, thank you because once again, your grace is abounding upon our church. Thank you, Lord, for the fine weather outside. Uh, after many days of rain, Lord, this is truly a respite for us. Dear Lord, as we prepare to worship as one body, we ask God that you might bless your ch the children who are here right now. We trust, dear Lord, that even as they attend their Sunday school classes, uh, your grace will be upon them, your mercy will be upon them, and I allow them to, to be able to apprehend uh, that, which is being, that, that which will be taught to them by the teachers. We pray for your love to be upon the teachers as well. We trust that you, they will be patient, they will be creative even in the way they discuss their lessons. We submit them into your hands, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. All right, kids. You may now go off. Okay, you don't need your dada or your mama to bring you there. You know the routine. You know you'll be safe there. Yung iba talagang ayaw, pahiwalay pa eh. Alright, uh, today is our first Sunday for the month. So if you are a believer, you are invited to join us later for the communion service. Okay, do we have first timers today? Right in our midst, meron po ba tayong uh, first timers? Is anybody here for the first time? None? Zero? They're pointing at people. Uh, I guess uh, you're ignoring them. Okay, anyway, if you're a first timer here, we normally have a, a welcome orientation for you, but because of its because it's communion sunday we forgo that but next sunday maybe you'd like to know more about us so, let's come before the lord in prayer thank you dear god for this wonderful time that you've given your people here in higher up to worship you we recognize dear god you are our shepherd you are our teacher and so we ask, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, open our understanding, open our eyes so that we might behold the Lord of glory. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that, that you've given us, your people, to study your word, to ponder the truths embodied here for the betterment of our souls. Thank you, God, because this, is, this will be accomplished not by our own strength, but only through the ministry of your Spirit. And so we entrust ourselves to you, dear Lord. We give you back all glory, honor, and praise for you alone deserve this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Let me ask you. Do you know what the brightest spectacle in the entire universe is? The brightest spectacle. Well, scientists say it's a supernova. No, that is not the name of a new comic hero, superhero. A supernova is the colossal explosion of a star. NASA says that a supernova is caused by the last hurrah of a dying massive star. And this happens when a star at least five times the mass of our sun goes out with an extremely bright and fantastic bang. And the Encyclopedia Britannica wrote that when a star goes supernova, considerable amounts of its matter may be blasted into space with such a burst of energy as to enable the exploding star to outshine its entire home galaxy. So it's very, very bright. It's, it's really a glorious and powerful occurrence. I opened with a description of a supernova because here, uh, it, because it is the closest thing I can think of or I can wrap my head around to imagine the Lord Jesus in his glorious, powerful, infinite brightness. 
I am talking about the account of Matthew in his gospel. This dramatic event is significant because here in Matthew 17, the Lord is beginning to turn more and more to Jerusalem and the suffering and death that awaited him there. But before all that would take place, there was a glimpse of the Messiah's glory. We let's please open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 17 and let's read from verses 1 to 8. Again, I'll be reading from the NASB. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a, vo a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. Now let me establish the context of this incident. In the quietness of Caesarea Philippi and the shadow of Mount Hermon, the Lord Jesus asked his disciples, if you will recall in chapter 16, verse 15, but who do you say that I am? And the disciple Peter, speaking, of course, in behalf of the others, responded for the group saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This was a clear apprehension or a clear understanding that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, the anointed of God. And then the Lord began to spell out the, de the details and show, according to verse 21, show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. As we have noted in our past lessons, the thought of Jesus suffering and dying at the hands of his enemies was unbearable to Peter. Thus, Peter grabbed hold of Jesus as if to hold him back from this life-threatening uh, life harm. Matthew tells us in verse 22 of chapter 16, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. As we have learned, Peter and the disciples were expecting a victorious king, not a suffering servant. Peter seems to have missed the promise of the resurrection on the third day, and he rejected the idea that Jesus would suffer and be killed. So much so that he rebuked Jesus for, uh, for it while claiming he would not allow it to happen. The response of Jesus to what Peter said was some of the strongest words we hear from his lips. Verse 23, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's listeners, but man's. So the Lord gave Peter a much-deserved stern rebuke for being a spokesman for Satan and becoming a stumbling block. That is, a temptation to avoid the suffering that would come in Jerusalem. In a manner of speaking, Peter wanted the crown without the cross. Now, the Lord used this opportunity to teach his disciples about what it meant to follow him. He explained that the kingdom of God is about God's interests and not man's. It requires following the Lord Jesus in a wholehearted, sacrificial manner. This is how the Lord put it. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me.
For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So the Lord teaches that following him is nothing less than considering your life as dead. Let me repeat that. Following him is nothing less than considering your life as dead. And your only reason for continued existence is to serve the Lord Jesus and His cause. Now that is, a radic that is radical because it is totally against man's natural desires. But according to the Lord Jesus, it is the only reasonable way to live. Why? Because, as the Lord points out, anyone that lives for the present and what they can gain for themselves will find in the end that their life was a waste and that the hole in their souls still remains empty. Think about it. Does wealth, do wealth, fame, and success feel the emptiness of the human heart? Well, let's hear it from those who have been there. From those who became rich and famous. In 1988, George Harrison, member of the world-renowned Beatles, told Time magazine, At first, we all thought we wanted the fame. After a bit, we realized that that wasn't really what we were after at all, just the fruits of it. After the initial excitement and thrill had worn off, I, for one, became depressed. Is this all we have to look forward to in life? Being chased around by a crowd of hooting lunatics, lunatics from one crappy hotel room to the next? That's George Harrison. The desire for fame is a sign that an ordinary life has ceased to be good enough. But fame really just means that you get noticed a great deal. Not that you get understood. It does not mean that you get understood. It does not mean you get appreciated or even loved. In the midst of all the fame and all the riches, Take note George, what George Harrison asked. Is this all we have to look forward to? Now, some of you younger folks will certainly recognize NBA superstar Kevin Durant, right? Some of you I know that you're, he's your favorite. My favorite is Will Chamberlain. <laughs> you don't probably know him anymore. No, I'm just kidding. Well, you know Kevin Durant. Well, he was once asked about his spike in technical fouls and ejections from the game. He said, it's just my emotions and passion for the game. Later in the interview, Durant adds, after winning that championship, I learned that much had not changed. I thought it would fill a certain void. It didn't. And what about the stuff of the, the rich and the famous? Well, all their stuff will be left behind. That's for sure. They do not take any of it with them. When you die, you don't bring your possessions with you. And even fame, if you are remembered at all, will not make any difference to you when you're dead. So the Lord is right. There is nothing in this life that is valuable as your soul. Therefore, yielding your life in the present for eternal purposes is much wiser. And in the end, it gives meaning for the present and for eternity. The Lord then concluded His instruction to His disciples with a, comment, uh, with a confirmation about the promise of a future, which is what they had been expecting would occur 
And that sets up the scene for what will happen in our passage for study this morning. So in his concluding instruction in chapter 16, the Lord said, truly, truly, I, uh, truly, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Lord Jesus was going to Jerusalem to suffer and to be murdered. And then he would be raised from the dead and will return one day in the glory that the Old Testament had foretold. However, Despite the hundreds of prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures concerning the Messiah, there was little to no understanding among the Jewish people that he would come twice. You see, the Jewish interpreters of the scriptures rationalized and spiritualized away the Old Testament references to a suffering Redeemer. They saw it. They read it. But they spiritualized it. They tried to rationalize it because they could not accept that. So now the Lord explains that there would be two separate comings of the Messiah. His first and present coming was as a humble servant suffering on behalf of sinful man. But his second coming will be as divine king with his army of angels to conquer and to judge. Now, the Lord's promise in verse 28 raises a problem because all the apostles have died, and yet Christ has not come in power and glory. Was the Lord mistaken when he made this promise? What was the Lord referring to here in verse 28? Well, last week I said that I believe that there are two ways that the Lord's promise to the disciples was fulfilled, and both are previews of Christ's second coming. First, we said, when we consider the parallel passage in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, where Jesus said, Truly I said to you, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death. And then, it says, until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. The line, the last line, until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power, I believe refers to the coming of Jesus in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. On that momentous day, the Lord's apostles witnessed Gentiles and Jews swept into the kingdom of God as they came to faith by believing the gospel. So well within the lifetime of those who heard Jesus speak this promise in chapter 16, verse 28, they saw the kingdom come with power. And soon, they will also witness the power of the gospel message sweep across Asia Minor and on to Europe. But there is another way that the promise in verse 28 is fulfilled. Some of the disciples would be given a vision of Christ's kingly majesty by way of the transfiguration. So Jesus, I think, was also referring to his transfiguration. And this will happen before the disciples left the earth. As it turns out, this promise from our Lord was fulfilled only six days after it was given, or about a week. So this preview of the majestic glory of King Jesus in which he will one day come to this earth and reign was granted to witnesses who would then pass it on to us. This is the context that establishes the incident described in our text today. And it is essential to keep this context in mind as we examine the Lord's transfiguration. And so we read in verse 1, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Most of us will probably just read through this verse without this verse realizing that uh, it actually provides some significant details. If you check the parallel passage uh, in Luke, 
we see more details bring, brought out. And so, what I'd like to do is to s investigate s some of the significant details. First, let's look into the timing of this event. Luke's Gospel tells us, uh, uh, Luke actually generalizes the time as some eight days after these words. Okay, so he says eight days. Luke 9, verse 28, the second part. In contrast, both Matthew and Mark are precise that what happens next is six days. Six days later. Now, skeptics claim that the Bible has contradictions. You know that. You've probably met some of them. But the truth is, it does not. To be sure, the Bible has difficult passages, but not contradictions. So how do we explain the discrepancy between Matthew and Mark's account against Luke's report? Luke who said eight days, while Matthew and Mark said six days. Well, this is probably different, a different way of observing the same event. I mean, Luke could be accounting for the days in this manner. Day one is entering Caesarea Philippi, where the Lord asked, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Then six days of travel. Then day eight reports the saying during the transfiguration. So he says eight days. Because that's his, he counts from that day, from the time they entered Caesarea Philippi. Another way to explain this seeming discrepancy is to understand that Luke, who wrote to the Greeks, could be using a Greek phrase indicating a general period of time, which is roughly equivalent to us saying about a week later. You know, we, if it's referring to something like six days or eight days, we would probably say in our time about a week later. Okay, so he might have also used a Greek terminology, a Greek uh, term uh, depicting about a week. But why was Matthew so precise about the number of days after he instructed and gave his disciples the promise in verse 28? Well, I raise this question because Matthew usually starts a transition text like this by mentioning something about the geographical location okay but he rarely mentions time i wonder if you notice that so the mention of the six days by matthew strikes us as odd but it may also point to something significant now how is the timing of six days significant well, it would seem that Matthew, who, if you will remember, wrote his gospel primarily for Jewish readers, it would seem that Matthew wanted his Jewish readers to relate what happens here in Matthew 17 with the days of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. God created the heavens and the earth and everything it contains in how many days? Six days, correct? On the seventh day, he rested. But there is more. Matthew wanted his Jewish readers to make a connection between Moses and Jesus Christ. Alright? Matthew did not just want it to make a connection between Jesus and the God, the being who created the heavens and the earth in six days. He also wanted the Jewish people, his Jewish readers, to make the connection between Moses and Jesus Christ. He wanted his readers to view the Lord Jesus as the new Moses, the new lawgiver. Remember in Exodus 24, verses 15 to 16, we are told that Moses went up Mount Sinai and the glory of the Lord rested on the mountain for six days and on the seventh the lord's voice called out to moses and every new every jew knew that the glory descended on the mountain or rested on the mountain for six days another detail worth noting is the fact that our lord brought up the mountain with him 
only three of his disciples. Right? This is another significant detail. Peter, James, and his brother John. Why take these three men? Why not all 11 or, or even Judas? Why just the three men? Well, the Lord Jesus needed eyewitnesses to what was about to happen. Remember, the Old Testament law demanded that the truth be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Right? Deuteronomy 19 verse 15 puts it this way. A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three, I, a true witness, two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. So the witnesses of these three men apparently mattered to the Lord Jesus. It wouldn't do if he just took Peter with him or just one of them. He wanted the three witnesses because that's what Jewish, the Jewish law says in Deuteronomy 19. Now James was the first to be martyred. So we do not have a written record from him. But Peter and John both refer to this event of the transfiguration in their writings. Take note, in 2 Peter 1 verses 16 to 18, Peter wrote, For we did not know, we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What do you think was he referring to? The transfiguration. For when we, he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Verse 18, And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter was an eyewitness and he wrote about the transfiguration. For his part, John wrote in John 1 verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he adds, And we saw his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he even starts his, his gospel in that manner, talking about the transfiguration. Now, even if the gospel writers, specifically Matthew, Mark, and Luke were not present on that mountain, they would have gotten their information from any of these three disciples. They were legitimate witnesses to this incident. Peter, James, and John mattered to the Lord Jesus. Not only because they, were, they would be good eyewitnesses, but they mattered to Jesus also personally. personally. Why? Because He loved them. And they made up the inner circle of disciples that Jesus often gave more instructions to and often accompanied the Lord to the things that others did not. Like, for instance, the, race, the event of the raising of the dead of Jairus' daughter in Mark chapter 5 and in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26. Why were these three men part of the inner circle? We can never, we don't know. Scripture does not explain that. So, personally to Jesus, these three men mattered. But Peter, James, and John mattered to Jesus also missionally. You see, the, these three disciples would become the three pillars of the church, which Paul attested to even in Galatians 2 verse 9. He calls them the pillars of the church. The leadership of these men, their missionary work, and their writings would become most instrumental in building, growing, and sustaining the fledgling church. So that is probably also the reason why the three were chosen. The Lord knew that they would be pillars for the church. Now, a third detail worth noting is the place where the transfiguration happened. Where did it happen? On a mountain. The mountain is not specifically identified. All we know is that it was a high mountain and that they are by themselves, the, the Jesus and his disciples. But it is likely that the mountain referred to here is Mount Hermon. Why this mountain? Well, 
First of all, Caesarea Philippi is located on the southwest slope of Mount Hermon, so the Lord and His disciples had easy access to it. Mount Hermon is high, reaching 9,236 feet, with many peaks on its southwest extension that are over 7,600 feet. So when the Bible says they went up on a high mountain, this is a good candidate for being a high mountain, right? And third, it is rather a large mountain. So there were plenty of places the Lord Jesus could have been alone with the three disciples. So it's most likely Mount Hermon. Now apparently, mountains matter in Matthew's Gospel. If you haven't noticed that, Matthew kind of has this thing with mountains. In Matthew chapter... <laughs> In Matthew, I had, I, I had to just put that in. In Matthew chapter 4 to 7, we have the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 14, verse 23, we read that the Lord Jesus prayed on a mountain. In Matthew 15, verse 29 to 38, the Lord healed and, and fed the multitudes on the mountain. And Matthew just keeps mentioning this. In Matthew 24 and 25, the Lord taught on the mountain, specifically the Mount of Olives about the sign of His coming and the close of the age. And then, in Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, we read about the Great Commission, right? The final words of the Lord Jesus in this Gospel. And where did that happen? On a mountain. But let us not overlook Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Christ. Here we are told, in Matthew 4, verse 8, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. It would therefore seem that the high mountain of the transfiguration, which Matthew mentions, in, is in direct contrast to the high mountain of the temptation. On these mountains were the presentation, therefore, of true glory and false glory. Apparently, Matthew wanted to signify that. But why does Matthew seem to give special attention in his narrative that many episodes in the Lord's life occurred on a mountain? Why? Why this preoccupation with mountains? Well, I think mountains matter to Matthew because they matter in the Old Testament. Now, two incidents are significant to stress this. Aside from the event, when God spoke to Moses in Exodus 19 and 20, which happened on the mountain, we also note the time when God spoke to Elijah with a reassuring voice coming in a thin, gentle whisper, as we read in 1 Kings chapter 19. And both these incidents happened on a mountain. Therefore, since the transfiguration happened on a mountain, Matthew wants to announce to his Jewish readers that a great prophet has come. So, six days, three men, and a high mountain. That is our setting. Matthew then reports, And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. The Lord Jesus irradiated the glory of God. It was not as if a strong spotlight shone upon him. You know, like the, some of the photos that you, some of the paintings that you see of Jesus, there's like a bright light. No, it, it didn't happen that way. The light came from him. The glory came from within him. Mark tells us in Mark 9 verse 3 that the Lord's clothes became dazzling white whiter than anyone in the world could, could bleach them. So, clothes laundered with Tide, Breeze, Ajax, Ariel, Champion, ano pa? All these detergent soaps cannot compare to the whiteness of the Lord's clothes in this incident. At mas mabango pa. Better than Downey. I guarantee you. We are told that what uh, we are told what time the transfiguration took place. Um, I'm sorry, we are not told also about the detail of the timing 
of the transfiguration. It could have happened at night because in Luke chapter 9, verse 32, we are told that the disciples had been overcome with sleep. Moreover, we are told in Luke 9, verse 37, that it was the next day when they came down the mountain. So it could have happened at night. And, and you know, this is comforting for me. I mean, if the disciples can fall asleep when they are in the Lord's presence, <laughs> perhaps I should not, it should not bother me when people, when some of you go to sleep <laughs> while I'm preaching. <laughs> yeah, I do see you from my vantage point. <laughs> and I know that some of you do fall asleep and reason that you're just meditating <laughs> passionately and deeply about the sermon that you're hearing. Well, okay, all right, I'll accept that. But that does not explain why your mouths drop open when you're supposedly <laughs> meditating. So I wonder, well, can you meditate? <laughs> well, I'll accept you. I, I'll accept that you're not lying to me when you fall asleep. Anyway, it is also possible that this occurrence happened in the afternoon. If that was the case, we know that the glory seen by Paul on the road to Damascus was brighter than the brightness of the noonday sun. And the same would be true here if the transfiguration happened or occurred during daylight. Now, even if Peter, James, and John were dozing off at that moment, something woke their attention. Luke 9, verse 29, picture it this way. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. Now, the manifest radiance of the glory of God is a major theme in the Old Testament. The first reference of the glory of God is found in Exodus 16, verse 10, which says, It came about as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. It was the Shekinah glory of the Lord. This glory was like a burning fire. The prophet Ezekiel saw it as a bright, radiant rainbow as, we, as he uh, expressed or wrote in Ezekiel chapter 1. So, the parallel with Jesus Christ at the transfiguration to these incidents in the Old Testament is apparent. The Greek word for transfigured is metamorpho, and it translates into the English word metamorphosis. So, Jesus underwent an incredible metamorphosis right before their very eyes. Take a uh, woolly caterpillar. He will wrap himself inside a cocoon. And some great changes happen while inside the cocoon. Then the cocoon at some point unfolds, revealing a beautiful butterfly. Well, all of a sudden, everything that Jesus truly was on the inside, hidden in a cocoon of human flesh, was revealed outwardly. He was like that on the inside already. He did not become any different. Okay? He did, he did not become God at that moment. What was inside was revealed. Let us not forget that Jesus has always been God, even when he walked the earth. But his glory was veiled until this day. And on this mountain, his glory was not rejected from above, but radiated, but radiated from within. In the first of Peter Jackson's films, series of films of Lord of the Rings, if, I wonder if you recall a, that, in, that scene. We see there a transfigure, transfiguration scene. Remember that? In this scene, the elf queen, Galadriel, is offered the one ring of power by the hobbit Frodo Baggins. Now, this is tempting even for a strong spiritual being as Galadriel, the elf, elf queen Galadriel, because in her hands, she could indeed wield the ring to great and powerful effect. But 
like the wizard Gandalf who likewise refuses to touch or take the ring, Galadriel knows she would be utterly corrupted by the ring's evil. Thus, in the end, she will not touch or take the ring from Frodo. She cannot. But in the scene, she briefly toys with the idea and so, is, and so transfigures into a towering figure with a voice like the sound of many rushing waters. She shines with a bright incandescent light of terrifying power before finally shrinking back to an ordinary and normal looking elf. However, there is a difference between Galadriel's transfiguration in this scene and that of Christ upon the mountaintop in our text. We must note that Jesus did not transfigure into something he was not, much less into something potentially awful which happened to Galadriel in that film. But rather, Jesus transfigured to what he already is, the true Messiah, the true Son of God. Moreover, it's kind of uh, a reverse Galadriel transfiguration in another sense. You see, Galadriel transfigured at the prospect of taking on huge power, something she has never had before. But Jesus transfigured into his true glory, which was ordinarily hidden from the disciples' eyes on account of Jesus having given up his true divine powers in order to be born and become truly human. And it was the giving up of those divine powers that brought salvation to the world. So the Lord Jesus changed from humiliation, in other words, from being a, ordinary, from being a man, to the glory of his deity. He took on the form of his heavenly glory and was transformed. In other words, his deity was made visible to the three disciples on the mountain. In fact, Matthew says that the Lord's face shone like the sun or like the brightness of the sun. It was luminous, bright, radiant, shining, and gleaming. Perhaps like a supernova. The Apostle Paul wrote of the Lord Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance of a, as a man, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Let's be clear about this. Jesus did not empty himself on his divine nature, or of he did not empty himself of his divine nature or his divine attributes. He was still fully God, even when he walked the earth. What, people, what Paul meant is that the Lord Jesus limited the manifestation of his outward glory. He existed in the form of God. The essential attributes are unchangeable. Hence, the same essential nature of Jesus' deity never changed. The essential nature of Jesus is the same as the essential nature of God. The nature of Jesus is the nature of God. So the essential form never alters. It never changes. As Paul explained, Jesus laid aside his privileges of deity even though he was God-man. He was at all times fully God and fully man. Now, as if seeing the Lord Jesus transfigured was not incredible enough, we read another amazing development in the next uh, verse. Verse 3, And behold, Moses and, Ma and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. So Moses and Elijah became visible to the disciples. We don't know why they, what they looked like or how they got there. 
We also don't know how the three disciples were able to identify them as Moses and Elijah, right? Did you ever wonder that? Yeah. How they know? Yeah. My guess is they had name tags. Hi, <laughs> I'm Moses. And other, hi, I'm Elijah. So that's just my guess. <laughs> While we do not know the answers to these questions, we can make an educated guess about why these two prophets were there at that moment. Why were they there? Well, I think Moses was there as representative of the law. While Elijah was representative of the prophets. And remember, to the Jews, the law and the prophets comprise the whole of the Old Testament. Thus, we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, this is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. So here, Peter connects the New Testament apostolic ministry to the Old Testament prophets ministry by means of the Lord Jesus. Who's the connection? Jesus. So the presence of Moses and Elijah on that mountain represented a way of saying that the whole Old Testament revelation found its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. You see, the glory of the Old Testament lies in the fact that it is contained in and transcended by the New Testament. We may even say that in that transfiguration meeting, the law represented by Moses and the prophets represented by Elijah came to fellowship with the gospel represented by Jesus Christ. So thus, everything is united in Christ. Isn't that amazing? This incident therefore affirms what the Lord said earlier in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He said, Do not think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. So here in the transfiguration, we have a wonderful picture of that truth. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Now, Luke 9 verse 31 tells us that Moses and Elijah were speaking of his departure which was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So they had a topic. Mark tells us this. They were not talking, you know, so, kamusta naman? Kamusta dito sa, sa lupa? Well, medyo mahirap eh. Oo oh, nga, narinasan ko rin yan eh. <laughs> no, they, they were talking about one topic, one topic only. What were they talking about? The coming death of Jesus. They were speaking of his departure. You see, Jesus, and this is just my theory, Jesus needed comfort as he faced this prospect of the crucifixion. And he gets it from fellowship with Moses and Elijah. Their presence and conversation were the, the acknowledgement that Jesus was the one they had seen from afar. The one they had looked forward to. So Jesus needed comfort and these two provided that. But they also realized that this was what they were waiting for all this time. Jesus Christ. And interestingly, the two were speaking with Jesus about his death. The very same subject that recently so upset Peter. Peter was unsympathetic, remember. But this Old Testament saints realized they owed everything to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. The sacrifice of the servant of God. A.T. Robinson comments, and I quote, the purpose of the transfiguration was to strengthen the heart of Jesus as he was praying long uh, as he was praying long about his approaching death and to give these chosen three disciples a glimpse of his glory for the hour of darkness coming. No one on earth understood the heart of Jesus and so Moses and Elijah came. The poor disciples failed to grasp the significance of it all. James, Peter, and John. 
did not understand what was about to happen. But Moses and Elijah came to comfort Jesus. So the theme that engaged the wonder and interest of heaven was the approaching crucifixion of Jesus. This is the central event of time and eternity. And Moses and Elijah knew that they depended on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for their salvation and their glory. Thus, their conversation was consumed with Christ's death. They were consumed with the greatest event in history. But what I also want you to grasp is that God is the God of the living, not the dead. This point was clearly made by the Lord later on in Matthew 22, where, verse 32, where he said, He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Yes, Moses died physically, remember? But the transfiguration shows that he was still alive. His body was dead and buried, but he was alive spiritually in God's presence. As for Elijah, technically, he never died. He was brought straight to heaven without dying. And yet, here he was, 800 years later, still alive and talking with Jesus. One of the great teachings of Christianity is that those who die in Christ are still alive. The Lord said in John 11:25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. We can take comfort in the fact that our loved ones who died in Christ are with the Lord and we will see them again. Isn't that a great prospect? A.T. Robinson also said, and I quote, Moses led the exodus from Egypt. Jesus will accomplish the exodus of God's people into the promised land on high. End of quote. God is the God of the living, not the dead. And those who die in Christ are very much alive. Now, while Moses and Elijah were focused on the greatest event that was about to occur, Peter's mind was, well, somewhere else. Remember, Peter and his companions were overcome by sleep while Jesus prayed. And then he said in verse 4 of, Matthew, of, John, of Matthew 17, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You would think that by now, Peter would get the idea. But for some reason, he gets all beside himself and reveals his foolishness. The, the counsel of Peter was senseless and sinful. If Jesus followed Jesus, Peter's counsel, they would have turned the Lord from God's eternal purpose of redemption. Of course, there can be no eternal salvation without the vicarious, substitutionary, atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus did not respond to Peter. Suddenly, the glory cloud surrounds Jesus, Moses, and Elijah and begins speaking, as we see in Luke chapter 9. The heavenly father interrupted Peter's nonsense and said in Matthew 17 verse 5, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. There can be no greater authoritative testimony to Jesus' sonship and messiahship than the words of his father on high. Amen. At the baptism of the Lord, these words were directed if you will recall, to Jesus, confirming his understanding of his majestic office. Here, at the transfiguration, they were directed primarily to the disciples, confirming what Peter confessed six days earlier, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. See how wonderfully all of this ties up? Friends, the important truth from the transfiguration incident is the authentication of the Son as the Messiah by means of the voice that spoke to the disciples out of the Shekinah glory. This is the whole point of this episode. 
Jesus may be rejected by men, but here we note that he is accepted by his Father. But, that vo but the voice that commended Jesus also called on the disciples to listen to him. The only answer to Peter's suggestion, senseless suggestion, is essentially Peter quit talking and listen to Jesus. If Jesus says he is going to Jerusalem to suffer and die and rise again, then that is what is going to happen. If he says to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him, then that is what you should do. Listen to him. And that admonition to listen to the Lord Jesus applies to us as much as it did to Peter. So let me ask you, how have you done this past weeks, couple of weeks, since we took up what Jesus told the disciples? We've already talked about Jesus' Jesus's instruction to deny ourselves, to take up our crosses, and follow the Lord no matter what the cost. Have you consciously thought about considering yourself dead and living only for Christ? Or was the effect of the last couple of weeks' sermons only a passing emotion? I hope it is not. For the very purpose of your existence and the only hope you have for both this life and for eternity is bound up in listening and following what Jesus says. Listen to him. Now verse 6 reports the reaction of the disciples to hearing the voice of God coming out of the cloud. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. The three disciples were no different from anyone who finds himself in the presence of God when his majesty, majesty is on display. Remember, Isaiah cried out in Isaiah 6 verse 5, Woe is me, for I, am a man, uh, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among, an unclean, among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Daniel described himself as falling with his face to the ground, having no strength left in himself and his natural color turning to a deathly paleness. That, my friends, is the reaction of men when they come into the presence of the glory of God. Peter, James, and John were no different. Our text says they fell face down and were terrified. But one of the wonderful things about following Jesus is that he is considerate of our frailty. And so we see in verses 7 to 8, And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. There are many things that can frighten us, right? Such, those, such as those things that we do not understand. Things that are more powerful than us. And at times, even the presence of God. The good news is that we do not need to be afraid. And that when we are, there is someone there to comfort us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 states, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The disciples were afraid, and Jesus comforted them. When we are afraid, the love of the Lord Jesus comforts us, for it is perfect and was proven at the cross of Calvary. So the Lord came to them and comforted them. Get up and do not be afraid. And when the disciples looked, they saw no one but the Lord Jesus. The revelation was not given to strike fear in the disciples. Although revelation should bring the response of fear and obedience because of the fact that the sovereign Lord of glory has made himself known to us and has called us to obey. But 
the revelation was given to the disciples to convince and to encourage and to strengthen them in their faith and obedience. God, the Lord did not give them this episode, this incident, so that He might bring more fear into their hearts. No. He wanted to encourage, strengthen, and build their faith and obedience. For this reason, the Lord touched them. The touch was not simply proof that he was real. You know, they might have thought, is he now a ghost? No. Nope. He touched them. Not that they were, uh, so it was now proof that he was real and that they were his friends and that he accepted them. It was a reassuring touch followed by do not be afraid. The point is that God's revelation to his people is a demonstration of his love and his grace for them. Of course, we are overwhelmed by it. We are overwhelmed by the revelation of God. But at every turn, the revelation of God confirms to us that Jesus is our Lord, that our faith is not in vain, that we need not live in fear, but that we should live by faith in Him. If you are a believer, this episode, that transfiguration, should assure you that your faith is not in vain. No matter what happens in the world, no matter what, how many, th what many things you hear from the world discouraging you from believing, trusting, and living your life in obedience to Christ, I tell you, the transfiguration reminds you your faith is not in vain. Follow Him. Obey Him. Trust Him to the very end and you will not be disappointed. And the day will come when you will see Christ Jesus in His full glory. This episode should so encourage us, therefore. Matthew reports that this amazing event is to make the identity of Jesus Christ perfectly clear because the rest of the gospel will now focus on the rising opposition, suffering, and death. That's why it was also important. From here on, it was going to look like everything was downhill for the disciples. Jesus would be arrested, Jesus would suffer, and all of that. But the Lord wanted them to remember at least this incident. But the transfiguration revealed that He is the Lord of glory. That everything the Lord Jesus did actually pleased the Father. And that He is the one to be obeyed. Now the transfiguration brings us some important theological significance. Let me just uh, scan through them with you. First, first theological significance. The transfiguration anticipates the kingdom of God to come upon the earth. Jesus Christ and God's eternal purpose will be vindicated before the eyes of a watching world who rebelled at his call to obedience. The transfiguration is a kind of prelude, a pledge, a foretaste or a foreshadowing of the coming of the messianic kingdom which is promised to us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 16 to 18, Matthew 16, verse 28, and many other verses. Second, the transfiguration is also a picture of the personal resurrection of the Christian believer. So not only does it anticipate the kingdom of God to come upon the earth, it is also a guarantee of the personal resurrection of every believer in Christ. When Jesus comes, Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 21, He will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory. So Christ's appearance in glory anticipates our, 
our appearance in glory. We shall never reach our transfiguration but through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the Lord uses the experience to teach us to wait in anticipation of His second coming. Third, the transfiguration con confirms the Old Testament prophecy concerning the Messianic Kingdom. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1 verse 9, So we have the prophetic word made more sure. Therefore, every Jew who holds on to the law and the prophets in the Old Testament may now realize that the fulfillment of all the prophecies, all the types and promises have now been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. They now have cause to be more sure, as Peter says, and believe in everything that the Lord Jesus proclaimed. Fourth, the transfiguration affirms the authority of Jesus' teachings and redeeming grace. God the Father said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Our response should be the same as Peter and his friends. They fell down to the ground and were terrified. That is the beginning of authentic worship. May we, by God's grace, do likewise. To fall before God in authentic worship. And fifth, the transfiguration revealed Jesus as the perfect man. Here was evidence of the only man who never sinned. It is, it is said that the way you test an expensive crystal, I wouldn't know, I don't have an expensive crystal, mm -hmm. but the way to test an expensive crystal is by putting it to heat. The flame will find any flaw or any imperfection and will crack the crystal at that point. If there had been one blemish in Christ, the Shekinah glory on that mountain would have raptured the man Jesus. And all he taught and all he preached would have shattered into a million pieces. And if any fault had been found in him, he could not have died for our sins. But take note, while in the midst of the Shekinah glory, Jesus came out of that unblemished, uns unscathed, unhurt. Jesus revealed the perfect man. But from this episode, we may also glean a few practical applications. First, we must underscore the fact that the Lord Jesus needed to pray. While John does not mention this detail, the Apostle Luke tells us he went up on the mountain to pray. That prayer experience brought the glory of God to the disciples as they had never experienced. The transfiguration, in other words, immediately followed the prayer of Jesus. We too can experience of, of, awesome changes in our lives, if we would pray as the Lord Jesus prayed. Second, take note that the voice of the Lord was re reassuring and refreshing to Jesus. This emphasizes that the Word of God is the secret of spiritual life and its blessings. It brings prosperity to the soul. Hence, as we hear God's Word preach, we will do well to ask, is there something that the Lord wants to say to us today? Perhaps He has said it before and now He is saying it again. So hear or listen to that still, small, quiet voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you, reverently and implicitly calling you to Himself to come follow Him. Third, from this episode, we may also learn that our Lord sends, out, sends us out to live transformed lives before a watching world. We are familiar with Romans chapter 12, verse 2, 
and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. The word transform used by Paul in this verse is the same word for transfigured. And this underscores the fact that men who live in darkness see a reflection of the glory of God dwelling in every transformed Christian. And so Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with unveiled face, beholding us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. 2, 3, 2 Corinthians 3.18 Brethren, even now, as we behold Him in His Word, we are being transformed from glory to glory. And that is what the world is watching right now. Fourth, we need to remember to listen only to one voice, to Jesus, the Son of God. In Peter's foolishness, he proposed to build three tabernacles or tents for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And thank God he was not allowed to build another tent because the Lord Jesus is not at par with anyone in the Old Testament or in any world religion. The world only needs to listen to Christ's voice and Christ's word. Sadly, the world wants to treat Jesus Christ alongside, alongside all others. But we must realize that any devaluation of Jesus distorts who He is. And that is why Acts 4 verse 2 reminds us, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ alone is the ground of saving faith. And He is not at par with anyone. That was the mistake of Peter too. And so, this reminds us to listen to one voice only. To Jesus, the Son of God. At the end of this amazing episode, we are told that the vision passed. They saw no one except Jesus Himself. Everything was now refocused upon the extreme humiliation of the Son of Man, His coming, suffering, death, resurrection, ascension, and coronation. These men will not stay on that mountain for long. Soon they will go back down and will face the passion of Christ. But we are reminded here that one day the Son of Man is coming with power and glory and will establish His kingdom. And even so, we say, Come, Amen. Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. If you are here today and you now realize who Jesus is, and you want to bow and submit your life to Him, but you are afraid, maybe Jesus is touching your heart now, with these words, do not be afraid. Or perhaps you know him already in a saving way. I call you to reflect. How many times in your life has our God tenderly reached out to touch and reassure you? And has he not been faithful? No matter what you're going through, or as crazy as the world gets, Remember, God is on the throne. Arise. Do not be afraid. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, in our midst today, there may be those who have not yet come to saving faith. They have not received you as their Lord and Savior. I don't know why they are here. Perhaps they were brought by a friend but Lord, we know that you are sovereign. Nothing happens by accident. And so I pray, dear God, that if there are people here who now want to submit their lives to you, assure them, dear Lord, give them your love, your encouragement, 
and allow them by your grace to come to salvation by repenting of their sins. Allow them to realize that they are sinners in need of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Allow them to realize that the life they've been living apart from you has brought them nowhere, has brought them only pain and frustration, fear and discouragement. But Lord, let them look to you and repent of their sins and realize that you alone give life eternal. Help them, Lord, even now as they open their hearts to you. But I pray also for those who already know you in a saving way. I pray that you might tenderly reach out and touch them, reassure them, let them realize that their walk of faith is no small matter. Let them realize that trusting you is not a bad decision. Let them realize they're gone, that you are real. And so bless them in that point in their lives where they may be hurting, may be confused, or may be feeling uh, alone and lonely. Thank you, dear God, because you will answer this prayer. Even now, you are ministering to your people here in Higher Rock. Thank you, Lord, for our time together. And we ask, the Lord, that you might be glorified even as we prepare to celebrate uh, the Lord's table this morning. We give you praise for that which you have accomplished in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So please rise and let's just sing this song. love on us and chose us to be saved. This weaving life is passing by with all its joys and pain. But we believe to live is Christ and that is gain. To live is Christ to die is gain.
the Lamb was slain, who saved a countless multitude to glorify His name. We're yearning for the wedding feast of Jesus and His bride. His nail scarred hands will finally bring us to His side. To live is to rise, to die is gain. Every age is to remain. We will not fear, we're not ashamed. Thank you for encouraging our hearts today, O oh God. Indeed, our faith in Christ, our crucified Savior and risen Lord, is not in vain. Bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen.